This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired to get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. This episode is sponsored by CodeShip. CodeShip is a hosted continuous delivery service focusing on speed, security, and customizability. You can set up continuous integration in a matter of seconds and automatically deploy when your tests have passed. CodeShip supports your GitHub and Bitbucket projects. You can get started with CodeShip's free plan today. Should you decide to go with a premium plan, you can save 20% off any plan for the next three months by using the code RubyRogues. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at digitalocean.com. If you use the code Ruby Rogues, you'll get a $10 credit. Hey, and welcome to the Ruby Rogues podcast. We did a live Ruby remote conf episode. We talked about Ruby in a polyglot architecture, and we had a lot of fun doing it. This starts kind of in the middle because I forgot to record the first two minutes. So go ahead and just pick up where it left off, and thank you for listening. I guess, I mean, when I got started, I was using Ruby for tooling in a shop that was mainly doing C and C++ and assembly and stuff like that. So there's that. Uh, I've also you know, certainly worked in teams where it was, you know, the Ruby part was talking to another part that was written in Java or something like that. Gotcha. I've worked with a few shops where they had a back end that was, like you said, you mentioned Java. I've done it to .NET and back ends that were PHP. And I think I've done one with a Python backend. And so essentially then Ruby was kind of a front end layer that served up views and HTML. And then that all talked back to an API layer that was internal somehow. Um, I've also run into this where we were transitioning from .NET or some other technology into a system that was going to be pure Ruby. And so we kind of had to deal with things that way. The other thing that I've seen a lot of is Ruby set up as kind of the build tools. So in JavaScript and things like that, in some of the Node.js projects that I've, I've worked on, they've used Rake to do builds. I've also worked in companies where um, they're using something like SaaS or something, so they have Ruby installed to support uh, some engine or some asset system that they have. And so as part of their build process, they're using Ruby. That's how I've seen it used a lot is Ruby for scripting and the smaller tasks. Also, I've worked in a microservices e environment where some of the services were in Ruby and others in Clojure. When you talk over HTTP in JSON, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I've also seen things that back on to like Rescue or something because they feel like other systems like uh, RabbitMQ or something are a little bit too heavyweight. And so they'll pull in a Ruby queuing system and even though it's not tied into a Rails app, they'll use that to send messages between microservices. So it's it's really interesting to kind of get an idea of some of these uh, these things. I, I'm curious, overall, I've also seen it where it's mostly Ruby, and then you have other systems like Node.js that run specific services the other way. So instead of it being, you know, Ruby's part of a system that, you know, is supported mostly by .NET or Java, it's the other way around where it's mostly Ruby, and then you have... Node.js and WordPress and other things in the mix. Have you found that Ruby does really well in some areas and not others in these these kinds of setups, especially in the microservices areas? I'm afraid in our experience, it was write it in Ruby and then, oh crap, we would rather do this in Clojure. And then gradually um, services moved from Ruby to Clojure. 
I'm not really sure why. What was the source of the oak rat? That's a really good question. And you know, I don't know, other than uh, closure was cooler. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Ruby was like the cool language that the lucky Java developers could switch over to Ruby. And now it feels like Clojure is more of the cool language that people get excited about being able to write code faster than they could before. Ruby obviously is way more fun than Java, but maybe Ruby's not state of the art anymore. What do you think? Do you think it's keeping up? I don't think uh, languages keep up. <laughs> Ecosystems um, do, though. Yeah, that's true. I mean, sometimes, you don't choose yeah, a sometimes language. You get, sometimes you, you see an ecosystem that just completely fails to develop certain tooling, and, and other ecosystems really, um, really... Or like, that develops it too early, and then the people who develop it later do it better. I think Haskell suffers from some of that. It's package manager. I've heard a lot of complaints about. It's just it's been around a lot longer than some of the newer ones. Yeah, you get saddled yeah. with, with a whole lot of old code. Yeah, I have to wonder though if it's just that you know the old system has momentum, and you know we could do things in a newer or better way with the existing. Yeah, you know, and just update the ecosystem like you're talking about. So you know, the Haskell package manager could they write another one that works better, or is there something inherent in Haskell that makes it so that you know it just is never going to, you know, make the jump. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I wonder if it's just, well, there's already a package manager in Haskell, so why would you make a new one? And people would have to deploy to that. Whereas if you don't, then the package manager becomes a burden. It drags the whole language usage down. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I see a lot of sort of too little, too late things go on in languages. I mean, the Perl community has been doing a ton of work in building brand new tools that are, you know, learned from other languages. There's the whole concept of modern Perl, which of techniques and tools that are way different from what I knew as Perl, as like standard Perl programming. But at this point, I think most people and whole shops moved on. And so it's a shrinking audience that they're developing these things for, even though they're trying to keep up now. What are the areas where Ruby still beats the other languages? For me, I've built services in Node.js and in Ruby. I haven't done any enclosure, so I can't really address that. But I can say that there are a lot of options that feel a lot lower impedance to me uh, in Ruby than in JavaScript. And so in a lot of cases, you know, I'm happy to pick up Rhoda or, or Sinatra or something where it's, it's got a very simple routing interface and then run ahead and get something out there that works. The Ruby Remote Comp site is a good example of that, uh, where basically it's a Sinatra app. It has like four endpoints on it, and then the asset compilation is really the most complicated piece. I've got a little bit of Angular JS on the front end, but the rest of the back end is Ohm, which is an ORM that backs onto Redis. And so it's super simple. It's easy to get set up. I probably spent like two hours doing any of the technical programming on the website, and that includes all the time I've spent tweaking it since I did JS Remote Comp. So, you know, overall, I, I think that's a, a really helpful way, but a lot of times I think it really boils down to momentum and, and, you know, what people are used to using. And I wonder a little bit if I were more experienced with Express or something like that, or Koa, that, you know, I might be saying the, the same thing about JavaScript. Ah, you have a good point. So what's fastest for you to get up and running is what's fastest for you personally to get up and running. Yeah. And that is a historical question. Yeah, but the trade-off is is that, you know, I wanted something up fast. I didn't, you know, it wasn't about anything other than I need this out there now and it needs to work. And so that's what, that's what I went to. I think Ruby does actually have a, a really mature package management story. Uh, somebody in the, With Ruby uh, Tens or Bundler or both? Uh, yes, yeah. I, now that we have both and both are mature, I think it has a, has a really well-put-together package management story, especially compared to some of the other stuff that's out there. And yes, yes, CPAN is the original and and still in some ways the best, but even CPAN, I, now it's been a while since I've used CPAN, but I don't recall CPAN doing some of the kind of advanced dependency resolution for individual projects that that Bundler is capable capable of. CPAN was a great way of, you know, saying, okay, I want to install this library on my system and I want to get all of its, its dependencies and I want you to sort out like what mirror to bring it in from and then make sure, you know, verify it when it's installed. But Bundler is, yeah, uh, somebody, uh, Arthur in the chat is commenting that 
they've run into some some pain with npm and i haven't i haven't really used npm much myself but like i was just talking to someone who was talking about some of the stuff that goes on with npm where like it writes all the dependencies in subdirectories and so sometimes sometimes it writes so many subdirector the dependency chain is so long that the subdirectories become too long the path names become too long for the system and so then it has to come up with re- like uh, path rewriting uh, algorithms to make the paths not too long for the system and just ridiculous stuff like wow. that or or straight up installing different versions of a library in the two different versions of the library in the same project and having objects move from one version of a library to another version of a library and break for that reason. You know, these are hard problems, but if there's one hard problem that we've actually managed to solve after much pain and suffering, I think we've kind of nailed that one. Ha! I deny that anyone in our industry has solved dependency management. <laughs> I have, it has been a long time since I've had any cause for complaint with Bundler. You know, in fact, True. Ruby is the language that I've possibly struggled the most with with dependency management. Because, really? it, yes, I mean, even if you can get the bundler and your projects are set up okay, that's all right. But as soon as you start running on the same machine, projects that were compiled and written for different versions of Ruby, Ruby itself was polyglot. <laughs> I, I mean, we've had production problems like this. Oh, somehow another version of Ruby got installed on the machine, and now certain scripts break in certain weird circumstances, and it's always 18 dependencies down. Ah... Control your versions of Ruby better. <laughs> I, mean, I know that's you a know. terrible thing to say. I mean, I think that's but that's a problem with every language is you know your your local machine has a different version of the la- of the interpreter installed or the compiler installed than the than the production server does. You know, I'll give yeah. Java that backwards compatibility that causes such pain in language design. It does have its benefits. That's absolutely true. That's fair. I, I was actually going to point out the flaws that are caused yeah. in language design, but you kind of called that out. Um, Oh, yeah, totally. It's painful. Scala takes the opposite position of, no, we're not going to support... Well, in in the early days, they were not backwards compatible with previous versions, and a lot of people tried Scala and absolutely hated it and have forsworn it forever because they used it in that early stage and suffered from that lack of backwards compatibility. These days, Scala is, if they break backwards compatibility, they provide a migration path, they make sure it works for all the major libraries that are out there. They're somewhere in between. But yeah, with Ruby, and maybe it's, obviously we just didn't control our Ruby versions well enough. But you know what? I don't want to sit there and think about the Ruby versions on my production server and when I download somebody else's Ruby tool and use it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a little curious. Do we consider it a polyglot architecture if we're only using Ruby for like the build tools or deployment tools or you know something like Chef or Puppet where we're actually doing server setup or is that completely different where we're managing something else it's not the actual running application I vote for uh, deployment is part of the code and how you get your your code to production it's no good to you if it's not running in production though if there's code that gets it there that is production code I agree. So in other systems, I mean, I've built a few Node apps, and I tend to deploy them with Capistrano. Is that weird? It's a Ruby solution. But I haven't found a good option in Node. And no, Heroku doesn't count. I think it's beautiful if we can use the parts of an ecosystem that we love from one language to work with software that's also in another. I'll admit that I've also used Rake to trigger Grunt to do some work. Grunt is the sort of, it's one of the Rake equivalents in JavaScript. Rake is awesome. Yeah, it is. Rake is, is just enough, but not too much. And it's it's easy to dig into it and understand what's going on, which I can't say as much for, like, Make. Yeah, Make is, uh, it's one of those inscrutable systems. You just look at it and it's like, what is going on here? And, I mean, there are a couple of things that I don't love about Rake, but for the most part, it is awesome. And usually it's stuff like passing arguments to a rake task or things like that. It's just weird. But it's it's nice because it's approachable, it namespaces cleanly, and it's pretty easy to, if you put a description on it, you can figure out what things do. And, you know, it, it, it really is a terrific system. I do feel a little bit funny sometimes when I'm calling out to something else. So I mentioned that, you know, I've had it call out to grunt and run some grunt tasks. 
Um, and I always feel funny putting a little back tick, grunt, blah, 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 back tick in there. But, I mean, sometimes that's what you got to do. You see, so you Why run a you shell script. back tick instead of SH? SH? Yes, uh-huh. that's, the, that's, that's rake for run this shell command. Because I'm going to do that from now on. <laughs> Who has rake questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and yet in the end, it would take me a long time to use Rake for something. It goes back to what you know. If you know a tool really well, then you're going to be able to use it faster and more effectively, even if there might be some other tool more precisely suited for the task, if you already knew that one. Unfortunately, that makes it painful for other people on the team if they don't know that tool yet. Yeah. Yep. Rake is wonderful, Avdi. I'm not totally not criticizing Rake. That is not about Rake. That is about tools, period. But there are um, tools that are easier to learn, and are, there are tools that are harder to learn. Absolutely. I could totally go into like a whole talk on that and how the most important thing is the error messages. Yeah. Another thing that Perl got right. Really? You know, Perl is, has a famously inscrutable syntax. They're not ins- inscrutable, but very deep and complex. But if you got anything wrong in your Perl script, Perl would basically give you a dissertation about it. It would be like, okay, here's where the problem is. Now let me give you like three paragraphs explaining how this problem usually occurs and what you can do to fix it. That's wonderful. Yeah. I know that Elixir and Elm also focus very strongly on the error messages, that if you get an error message that you, that doesn't make sense to you, it's a bug in the language. I think that's a wonderful philosophy. Yeah, and well, and Pearl, as somebody, I was talking about this on Twitter, and somebody pointed out that probably reflects Larry Wall's um, linguistics background. He was always very linguistic oriented and and human oriented. And yeah, you know, it was more like, you know, Pearl talking to you and less like, oh, I have died. I do not know why. It's your problem now. (laughs) (laughs) Got a parenthesis when I wanted a curly brace. I'm teaching my sister to program and we've started with Ruby. And I have to admit, I'm really kind of sad to say this, but I regret starting with Ruby. And the error messages (laughs) are a big part of that. Mm. I think more and more as we go forward, and as we move into more and more polyglot architectures where, and this is, this is what I've encountered several times, in order to trace how something happened, how um, something got into production, I wind up tracing something through eight different tools and languages. And I have to understand at least a little bit about each one of those. And while I think it's beautiful to be polyglot and use the right tool for the job, it becomes more and more important that those tools be easy enough for a novice to at least be able to read and understand what's going on, for the error messages to make sense so that someone who doesn't know closure, for instance, doesn't have to learn the entire language in order to fix or understand, at least understand, this bug that's happening. And closure's error messages are worse than Ruby's, by the way. Yeah, that that is something that we should talk about here for a minute is, you know, what are the trade-offs of a polyglot architecture? I mean, you mentioned tracing errors from one system to the next to the next. And I think we see this mostly when you have several microservices that all interconnect that are in different languages. I mean, you you run into this even if you, they or aren't in different tools, languages. They call each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, are there any other things that you run into? I, I hear a lot of things about isomorphic JavaScript and... People saying, well, I don't have to change context when I move from the front end to the back end on web. And, you know, I, I call them out on that all the time. But, yeah, I mean, so do you lose something like in a polyglot architecture? Or does it depend on the team size or the company size? If you're switching between the front end and the back end or between a build tool and your program and you're not switching contexts, you are not abstracting. And what are you doing? <laughs> I agree. There's always a context switch, but yeah, there's there's also some cost to having to know the different language. To answer your question, Chuck, I think if you're a team of one, there is no negative to polyglot. As in, it, you only use tools that you choose to use. You use the ones that are the most useful to you. So right. where's the cost? I as soon as you add other people. That. Go on. I would actually, I and I have an example. So, yeah, I love building tool, building systems entirely myself just because they let me try things out without hurting anybody um, other than me. So I have uh, the reason that I know so much about Rake these because I've been through I've been to, through four different iterations of a book building tool chain, which is a pretty elaborate thing to, to pull together. It's many, many different tools. 
to pull together and for ebook publishing. And I've done it in Make a few times, and now I'm doing it in Rake. And the like the third time around, I decided to just have some fun. I decided to see like how far I could get with just using classic tools tied together with Make. So like picking each tool for like the thing that it did best. So I was using awk to do some uh, line-wise transformations, and I was using sed for other things, and I was for macro expansion, I was using M4 because M4 is like the standard GNU toolchain macro system. So instead of using a single language for all these different things, I was using all these little sharp tools, as they, as they say, all tied together by a huge make file or set of make files. And it was a fascinating experience, and I learned a lot, but in the end, it was kind of awful because, number one, as a single programmer, you know, I am separate people because I'm, I'm the Avdi that has all of his awk knowledge, you know, in main, main memory. And then another day, I'm the Avdi that has all of his M4 knowledge or his Perl knowledge or something loaded in main memory. And especially when I have to keep switching, swapping back and forth between that and the Avdi that has all the make knowledge in memory. And these things have, I mean, the, the larger sort of big architecture, not, uh, the big semantic differences aren't as, as big a problem. You know, when you're switching between, like, procedural code and functional code or something like that, that's not as, as big a problem to swap in my experience. It's the little things that hurt. It's the, the way string interpolation differs a tiny bit from one language to another. That, Or, you know, how one tool will automatically suck in environment variables and treat them as, as local variables, but another tool you have to explicitly pull the environment variables out of some environment hash or something. It's the little differences that, and that it was actually that experience where I decided to do it like the classic Unix way and tie all these little sharp tools together with a make file that convinced me to finally switch to using rake and actually tying a lot of Ruby scripts together using a Ruby make file. And the, the ability to keep the same knowledge in memory all the time massively increased my throughput. That's a great point. There's all that incidental complexity in switching languages that you save yourself some from with consistency. I can see. Yeah, and and some of those some of those tools are really sharp. I mean, awk is kind of neat. Like awk is underappreciated. Go learn awk. It doesn't take long, and you'll find some things that are surprisingly useful. Ruby has a lot of those things, but they're a little bit harder to reach for than they are in awk. So I guess there's a balance it's, between. It's not worth it. Right. If you're break if if you're doing something like what's an example that you would use awk for? I mean, I use it on the command line sometimes. It's great. Like, I would say, I'm trying to think of a, a good... So here's one task that I, I was doing. I was, like, taking files that were in a source format, going through them and stripping out delimited source code listings and running them through a highlighter and then uh, splicing them back into the original file. Not the original file, but, like, a copy of the original file. And... Awk is great for that sort of line-wise stuff. Like, if you've ever used the, the Bizarro switch operator in Ruby, which looks like a range but actually behaves like a control structure, um, that comes straight from awk. And it's, it's, it's the ability to say, between a line that looks like foo in a file and another line that looks like var in a file, as you're going through that file, I want you to basically switch modes when you're between these two markers. And it's great for, like, the limited hunks of text inside a, a, a well-structured text file. And you can build, in awk, you can build these state machines that, that basically consume events where the events are lines from a file, and they switch state based on what part of the file they're in and do different things based on what part of the file they're in. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I know that's not a great explanation, but it's surprisingly powerful for stuff like that. That's fascinating. Yep. So the, there's clearly a balance here, then, between... When do you use a language that is highly suited to the task at hand? And when do you use a language that's highly suited to where your brain is right now because that's the language you're currently reading? It's tough, right? Because like Avdi's kind of pointed out, you don't want to be the specialist in all the things. And if you can get stuff done in a consistent way, a lot of times even though there are better ways of doing it, you you know, ultimately it's the best way because you don't have the mental load. Yeah, like I, I, I worked on a system once for some of the really deep thought about uh, scheduling appointments. It called out to a prologue program and like two people in the company in the whole company understood the prologue program. And, you know, the thing is, there are logic programming tools written in other program 
in other languages or and there are probably also like C libraries that can be called into from from any language with bindings. Mm. I think the concepts of the logic programming wouldn't have been that hard to teach to some of us, uh, us other developers. But then we also had those concepts wrapped up in the the syntax and the semantic roles of prolog and the 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 history of prolog as well because you know it's an old language and you know older languages have funky things going on. And, <laughs> and that just it made it really unapproachable. That's interesting. I now I see that a lot in closure where okay, I feel like I've learned closure except for the macro system, but then I hit some code that uses schema or it uses core logic or it uses I'm blanking on the one that does go loops. And it's like there's this whole little sub language. Closure being a list supports like little mini languages inside. And I have to go back and learn and understand that sub language. But I guess it is better than shelling out to Prolog and having to learn all the Prolog and install Prolog on my computer so that I can try it. Maybe. Right? <laughs> you know, it's maybe better. It's hard to say with some of these things. Yeah. yeah. Because if you implement everything that Awk does in Ruby, pretty soon the language is so complicated that one person can't know all of Ruby, and then you have right. Perl. Or, well, you actually have Ruby, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I mean, Perl ha suffers from that problem, that there's so many ways to do everything that um, unless someone's following particular coding standards, you can't read someone else's Perl without understanding all of the particular features that they chose to use. Scala has the same problem. In a lot of well, ways. and in Ruby, we kind of went gonzo nuts with DSLs, internal DSLs as well, for a mm -hmm. long time. I think we're learning a little bit in some. Is that out of fashion now? I hope so. I like to think <laughs> it's going out of fashion a little bit. I, I like to think that people are are acknowledging that it's good to start with a nice API and then see how people use it, and then build some sugar on top if if it seems like a good idea, rather than starting with the sugar on top with no real API behind it. By API, you mean like. Classes they can instantiate, functions they can call. Yeah, like a, like an object, like a, a well-defined object model. Yeah. There are ways in Ruby to build internal DSLs where the DSL kind of is the only API, and mm, RSpec. Yeah, well, actually no, because no? RSpec has a well-defined uh, um, object model and API. Um, not everybody okay, knows it, never seen it, but used. it's there. It's well it's well documented, and it's what the sugar the RSpec sugar is built on top of. But, you know, you know the difference is you'll see, you'll see one system where when you look at the definition of the DSL, each DSL method is like one line of code. It instantiates an object from like the object level and uses it. And then you'll see another project where each method in the DSL is like long or, you know, maybe just 100 lines long. But, you know, it's basically it's doing all of those things that the DSL does. It's not just arranging for an object from the well-defined object model to be instantiated. I think you're totally right. I see this in Scala, too. Around here, some people have a tendency to jump straight to the DSL. But the DSL is really hard to follow. If you don't know the DSL, you have to learn the DSL. Whereas if you have an object model, people know how to trace that to see the method and see what it is, yeah. um, to see that I mean, object I structure. I think the equivalent in a, a Lisp closure or whatever is you can come up with a nice set of well-defined functions that operate on some well-defined data structures. And then on top of that, you can build some macros that you write some really weird looking S expressions and those macros do magic and that do a sec set of calls to those functions and those well-defined data structures. But you can also write a whole a bunch of macros that just have all that logic in line. Ooh, that's true. And there at that point, you're kind of conflating the view with the business logic. Right. Now right. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering to tie this back into uh, the discussion on polyglot art. Could this be considered maybe a downside of not having a polyglot architecture where you start trying to invent things within the system you have to do things like a DSL? Oh, good point. Where you start building Prolog in Ruby or in Clojure. Right. Because you don't you're reluctant to just use Prolog. Hmm. Right. I feel like I've seen some good examples of of this, like of things where there's a really good expression language that's all that's for a very constrained problem. I and mean, I guess the obvious example is just regular expressions. You know, you don't build up regular expressions using some Ruby DSL 
Um, so people, well, people have, have written some DSLs for that, but you know, generally you use the classic regular, you know, Perlish, grepish, regular expression syntax inside a string. Well, effectively a string, and that's just better most of the time. Even though regular expression syntax is hideous, at least it's fairly consistently hideous through many tools. Right. Such that it's just worth it to learn it. Yeah, and the yeah the knowledge translates usually. I feel that way about SQL. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone builds a DSL on top of SQL and. Personally, I get frustrated. Um, I would rather write yeah, SQL. I get yeah. frustrated by all of those DSLs. In, in some ways, I agree. In some ways, if it's... So there are some things that Active Record does, for example, in Rails, that I think are just really convenient. But when it gets complicated, yeah, having somebody you know, chain a whole bunch of stuff together that's really difficult to figure out, whereas just one string of SQL would be much easier to parse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. Yeah, I mean, the downside is that often when you're dealing with raw SQL, it becomes harder to, like, sort of modularize your parts and make them composable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because then your tools have to be very clever indeed about understanding what the SQL says so that they can compose it together without explosions. But, right. But In yeah. fact, this is a great example of what you said earlier with the object model. You said build the object model, that is, the, the straightforward programming language compatible model first. And then right. if you want an English EDSL, put that on top of that. They did that wrong when they made SQL. They started with the English, the English EDSL, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so now everybody tries to put programming models on top of that, which, yeah, yeah, just think about that. Somewhere there's a program that's getting run based on this English EDSL, and now we're all fighting to put programs on top of the English EDSL so we can just be programmed to it in the first place. Right. Like, if SQL had been defined sort of at two layers, one layer is like a semantic language of relations, and the, the, next, the next layer was an English DSL built to construct that semantic language of, of relations, I, I think it might have worked out a lot better. Exactly. Um, I, I will say it is sometimes a good idea to build DSL first because it's, it's kind of the, the idea of readme-oriented programming. Like, if you have a particular language in, in your mind that you really think would make it easier to work in a specific domain, you might, you know, basically write your readme that shows that really easy-to-use DSL and then figure out, okay, how do I make this work on the back end? But I think it's still important at that point. Like, let's map these DSL commands to, you know, one line of code that instantiates some, you know, that, that creates something in that, in that object model. True. It also... Um, you don't know when you start writing those DSLs how useful they're going to be. If you write them as the object model, it's a lot easier. And then you can see how useful it becomes and whether it stays in production or whether it gets deleted next week because that feature wasn't wanted so badly after all. I find yeah, this enclosure. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, yeah. I found this enclosure where I can do that, that game where I just start typing the code that I want to read and then make it executable. And that if I just add a few little tweaks, like a function call here and there, just, you know, it's closures, add more parentheses, it'll work. Then yeah. I can make that executable as simple functions with no macros. The, the farther back I go in my programming history, the more I see myself wanting to make these really small gains in, like, concision, you know, in, in the, the smallness of what I had to type. Are you, wait, are you saying your fingers are less lazy now? yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, the, the farther I go back, the more I seem to be concerned with, I've typed this thing three times, and I shouldn't have had to type it three times, so I should have DSL that would have kept me from having to type it three times. And ah. then as, I, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I, I'm more like, yeah, whatever. I mean, I still don't like Java. I still don't like the... <laughs> Java is the extreme of that, yes. Yeah, you know, I still don't like the, the wholly unnecessary repetition of the string array, which is the string array, shall be the string array that I have named string array. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to think that might make it easier to learn programming, though. I'm not convinced. <laughs> I don't know. Let it convince me. Okay. The convincing is I had my sister make a class, and the class had uh, an initialized method that accepted a parameter, which went into an instance variable, and then an adder reader so you could access that from the class. Oh, and then later you call 
the class name dot new and you pass it something. So you have to know that when you say class name dot new, it goes and finds the class and calls the initializer method. Then it whatever you passed in the argument, it puts that in the parameter. Okay. Then that parameter uh, is just just an identifier, but then it gets assigned to something with an at sign in front of it. And it's important the name of the thing with the at sign match the thing with the colon in front of it at the at a reader, which you can then access with a dot in front of it when you call the reader on your class instance. Yeah. That's really not clear. And, and that's, uh, that's, but it's sugar, right? It, you don't have to declare your instance variables in Ruby, and you don't have to make the explicit getter method. And that's lovely when you're experienced and you know about parameters and you know about accessors and you know about instance variables, and that at sign clues you in for the scope of it really fast. But it's, it's not simple. No, no. Uh, Ruby is kind of a second-rate language for, for learning programming, in my opinion. It's sad because there's it so is, many awesome resources out that, there. Yeah, it's true. But it's it's highly optimized for people that have been working in an object-oriented programming language for many, many years. And, mm. you know, it sort of optimizes for the, the set of frustrations that most people who have been working in an OO language for many years have. So that's interesting. It says Ruby is a tool that's optimized for people with a particular history. Oh, yeah. I'm curious, how many people in the audience was Ruby your first language, or pretty close to it, your first like, language that you used a whole ton? So I'll chime in on this because, I mean, I did Java, C++, C, and Assembly in college. But once I graduated from college, Ruby was kind of my first big, it was my first professional language, we'll put it that way. As a professional, it was the first language that I really used on a regular basis as a professional. But you already had the concepts of arguments yeah. and parameters and objects and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had been doing basic in junior high and high school and assembly in high school. And then I had come up into Java and C++. So, yeah, I knew the concepts. So, yeah, it wasn't my first introduction to those concepts. So, um, in the chat, Arthur asks what I think is a good, a good language for beginners. I, I think any language that has a laser focus on limiting the number of elements, you know, a very small set of concepts used consistently. First ones that spring to mind are uh, Smalltalk. You know, the syntax of Smalltalk very deliberately can fit on like a note card. And the semantics don't take much more to explain. Scheme as the sort of simplest of the lisps, I think, and or anything, you know, any scheme derivative. Uh, somebody mentioned Racket in the chat. I want to say JavaScript just because it actually does have a relatively small number of concepts and it is incredibly accessible because it's everywhere. But I'm, I'm iffy on JavaScript because it has so many gotchas. It has so many just irrational legacy gotchas. And the um, error messages, OMG. Yeah, and yeah, there's that as well. I think it's still well, very high up in the running just because its accessibility, its availability sort of stomps on everything else. But yeah, I, I lean more towards like a small talk or a scheme. Even Python is honestly a lot simpler in terms of concepts than Ruby is. So there's that. Yeah, I've heard a lot of recommendations for Python because there's another consideration in a learning language, and that's how quickly can you do something useful, which Ruby has fantastic stories for that. You can get up a website that's useful. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're learning, you need to have that early success. I mean, unless you get really excited about putting something to the console, Racket's probably not going to give you that. The other thing that I want to point out is a lot of these have online REPLs of some kind. Yay. So you can actually go to a website and, you know, find some somebody who's implemented, like, tryruby.org or something where you can, you can yeah, type stuff in and, and get feedback immediately. All yeah. of these are, like, they're ramps. There's a lot of ramps into learning a language. Being able to do something useful, JavaScript just wins hands down there, but Ruby is up there as well. Uh, those interactive environments, um, there's a lot of those for JavaScript and for Ruby. Uh, those help people get up to speed because they let them play, they let them see the results, they let them learn interactively. Yeah, and oh, I wanted to relate that back to what we talked about earlier, error messages. 
uh, being a big part of that ramp. And the error messages are awesome because they apply not just when you're first learning it to learn and to play, but also when you're learning it in order to dig through someone else's code to figure out what they were doing and what it's supposed to do and troubleshoot this polyglot system that you're working on that you didn't write the whole thing. The, yeah. the ramps, especially error messages, uh, serve multiple purposes that way. They make it a language more useful in a polyglot environment and they make it accessible to people learning it. Yeah, one thing that's really interesting when you're discussing the error messages though is that if you're in a polyglot system, you have to be very careful to make sure that the error messages reflect the boundaries. And what I mean by that is if you get something that you didn't expect as an input or output from another system, then it's got to be very clear that that's what you did or didn't expect. Otherwise, you're going to be digging through a stack trace in JavaScript where, in fact, your problem is in your Rails app. That's a matter of our APIs, right? As programmers, yeah. we're all language designers. When we're producing some sort of API, whether it's at the class level or the service level, that other systems are going to interact with. And we need to be careful about our error messages there. Yep. So we're starting to get to the end of our time. Are there any other things we should talk about with respect to polyglot architectures? One thing that came to mind real quick, Arthur just put in there that they played with JRuby inside of a Java project. And that's another thing that I see a lot in polyglot architect. Um, you know, people mix like Elixir and Erlang because they run on the same virtual machine. Or, you know, you have the JVM and all of the languages that run on there, including JRuby, and I think there's a Python version that runs on there and a whole bunch of other different options that, you know, you can pretty much send messages and call methods through the JVM to something else that's written in another language. And, yeah, you're, you're opening yourself to debugging pain there, definitely. Yes. But at the same time, there are companies out there that have a, a large investment in the Java ecosystem. And so they have all of the, the paid support versions of like JBoss and things like that. And so rather than uh, or Tomcat, but rather than, you know, switch over and use MRI, you know, they just run JRuby and their, the rest of their tech stack for the most part just lines up. That's, so they're doing um, waterfall architecture there when they purchase those mm -hmm. big open source, or, or, well, they purchase the paid version of, well, anything, and then make all their architecture fall in line with that. I see that a lot. Yep. All right. Well, I just want to give a, a shout out and a thank you to the Rogues for coming on and chatting with us for an hour. This has been really, fun. really interesting. This was fun. Yeah, yeah I agree. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the Rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues dot com slash park.